Okay, recording. So this is the uh, first uh, symposium on the role of the unconscious in the architectural imagination, uh, sponsored by the Institute for Psychoanalytic Studies in Architecture. So I'll just, uh, uh, yeah, I did, I sent them. I sent all the abstracts, so. I'll look for them. Okay. Uh, so I'll just uh, read a brief statement here, about 10 minutes, uh, and then uh, Wooter and Francesco and Don and I will present our abstracts, and uh, we should have plenty of time for feedback and discussion. What can psychoanalysis offer to the imagination and creativity of architects in understanding their role in society and solving problems? What does architecture tell us about the human psyche? The imagination is necessary for architecture as a mode of knowledge. The imagination bridges the gap between perception and understanding. Architecture is a mode of thought different from other ways of thinking. How does the imagination work in the relation between the imaginary, symbolic, and real as defined by Lacan in the intersec intersection of perception and language? What role does the unconscious play in the formation of images and dreams in the imagination? The signifier in the unconscious plays a role in the formation of images. Should images be seen solely in the realm of the imaginary or conscious thought in the ego? Or can they be seen as an interweaving of the imaginary and symbolic, conscious and unconscious? Does the signified play a role in the formation of images? How are the images situated in the realm of the big other? Can an underlying conceptual organization of experience be related to the unconscious? How are images generated in the intersection of perception, language, and the unconscious? How can forms and architecture reflect <laughs> the psyche? I think Tim is joining us there. Uh, architecture is based on function or conscious reason and image or conscious ego. How can the unconscious be incorporated into architecture? There are many elements of the human psyche which are studied in psychoanalysis that are neglected in contemporary architecture and architectural theory. It is necessary to map a way that these other elements can be incorporated into architecture through educational reform in the form of work groups, seminars, symposia, and publications. It is necessary to define specific concepts in psychoanalysis and analyze historical precedents in architecture in order to enable contemporary architecture to communicate and contribute to people beyond function and image. It is necessary to understand how architecture is influenced by its own unconscious or big other, its media, technology, conventions, politics, social conditions, cultural values, and the desire for the big other. Architecture needs to understand the ways in which the psyche is understood in psychoanalysis and incorporate them in architectural education and practice, in particular, the role of the unconscious. Why is everybody muted all of a sudden? I can't see anybody. <laughs> Elements of the knowledge of the unconscious that can be incorporated into architecture include gaps, scotomata, fragmentation, incompleteness, discontinuity, vacillation, absence, contradiction, méconnaissance, inaccessibility to the self, insertion of the self into language, dream work, condensation and displacement, dream images, hallucination, imagination, poetic language, metaphor and metonymy, the unheimlich, the sublime, the pleasure principle, the death drive, sensation, jouissance, dusting, sublimation, palimpsest, perversion, neurotic, psychotic, the dialectic of the subjective and objective, phenomenal and numinal, inorganic and organic, etc. Each of these elements can be the subject of site studies of buildings, landscapes, and urban configurations, and proposals for new ways of doing architectural research and experimental design. As Freud said, no application of psychoanalysis has excited so much interest as its use in the theory and practice of education. As Lawrence Holm wrote in the Introduction to Architecture and the Unconscious, there are a number of recent texts that draw on psychoanalytic theory as an interpretive approach for understanding architecture 
or that use the formal and social logics of architecture for understanding the psyche. But there remains work to be done in bringing what largely amounts to a series of independent voices into a discourse that is greater than the sum of its parts in the way that, say, the architect Peter Eisenman was able to do with the architecture of deconstruction, or that the historian Manfredo Tafuri was able to do with the Marxist critique of architecture. Lawrence continued, by addressing the unconscious, we open up new ways of thinking about architecture. An interdisciplinary discourse between architecture and psychoanalysis may be able to address the link between individuals, cities, and communities. Psychoanalysis is the talking cure it is the model for a certain kind of problem solving, which involves solving seemingly intractable problems in the real world by untying the internal knots that prevent thinking creatively about solutions, Lauren says. The imagination is usually explained in terms of neuroscience, cognitive psychology, or phylogenesis, all based in consciousness. Explanations of the role of the unconscious in the imagination are hard to find, but if psychoanalysis has shown anything, it is that the imagination is not possible without the unconscious. The role of the imagination is central to the conceiving of architecture, thus the role of the unconscious. Jacques Lacan tells us that prior to the mirror stage, the infant experiences unmediated visual perceptions of the environment around it. It is absorbed into the environment as it were, and does not distinguish itself from the environment as it has no consciousness of itself in relation to or in distinction from the environment. This all changes when it first recognizes itself in the mirror as an image or an object in distinction from the environment as an orthopedic totality. The independent orthopedic image of the self as a totality in relation to the environment doesn't quite mesh with the self of the subject that has been formed in relation to the environment prior to the mirror stage, so a split in the subject occurs of the Hitchens. From then on, the psyche of the human subject is marked by the split or self-alienation between the imaginary, the conscious ego and perception brought about by the mirror stage and the self-recognition of the subject as an orthopedic totality and the symbolic or the unconscious, which is being formed by the big other linguistic representations of the relations between the self and the environment. The mirror stage occurs, not surprisingly, when the infant begins to speak. The linguistic representations and the unconscious solidify the independence of the orthopedic ego from the environment. From the mirror stage onwards, a direct unmediated, unmediated perceptual experience is no longer possible, contrary to what the phenomenologists say. All perceptions become functions of the mechanisms of the perceiver's psyche. All perceptual experience becomes mediated by the unconscious, by the underlying linguistic structure of experience. The imaginary, the perceptual experience is absorbed into the bot symbolic as it were, and the perceiving subject is defined by the language of the big other, which forms its identity. Immanuel Kant said that objects can only be perceived and thought as part of a manifold, a totality of all thought and experience, which defines everything that is perceived within it. The role of the manifold creates an apperception, a combination of multiple perceptions, as opposed to a, a one perception, a singular act identifying a singular object. It is impossible for me to perceive an object without conceiving it in relation to everything else I perceive in the manifold. This is the function of the big other, the unconscious in Lacanian psychoanalysis. Cognitive science tells us that it is impossible to perceive an object without constructing it in our minds first. Thus in architecture, the architect must understand the relation between perception the representation of perception, the underlying linguistic structure of experience, and the unconscious. While the roots of the formula for psychoanalysis can be found in philosophy, as elaborated by Lacan, it is contrary to the philosophy of phenomenology. The architectural imagination has to involve the relation between words as representations and visual images as forms. The underlying linguistic structure of the psyche plays a role in the formation of visual images in the unconscious mind. An understanding of how the unconscious mind works in relation to conscious thought and experience leads architects and artists to create visual forms which act as guidelines to an exploration of the human psyche. <clears throat> so brief 10-minute uh, uh, introduction. Uh, and so now uh, we can each uh, present uh, our abstracts uh, in the order uh, in the email. So uh, Wooter. 
Uh, if you could go first, Wouter is a professor of architecture in Brussels, where the weather is beautiful. Uh, so, uh, Wouter, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you see my screen. That yep. Works. Yep. Sorry. Okay, good, good evening for, for me, uh, at least. Um, my abstract is, uh, of today will present the, 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 the topic, uh, uh, less the, the, the way I hope to develop it in, in the paper itself. It's about uh, Touche and the trompe and the work of uh, architect and developer Vintalieu. It's a Belgian office. Uh, in particular, I will talk about the a team within their work of cutouts and mirrors that construct the tension between the subject's perception of the architectural object and the gaze that pierces through the photographic uh, image. I will show you some images of what I'm, uh, I'm talking about. Um, so we have cuts in, for example, this work, the gallery Rosamo Twerk in uh, Ghent, that remind of uh, the work of Gordon Mata Clark. Uh, they also work with other types of cutouts, such as uh, this one, an image of a wide concrete base that cuts the house in six, uh, 16 out of its context and reveals itself as if it was a collage uh, or a painting of at Ruche. Models and pictures of models also reverse uh, uh, yeah, play, uh, the game between reality perception and so the theme of the uh, trompe figures here as well. In the Twiggy shop, uh, you see portions of the floors and walls that are se selectively cut and removed to create larger spaces inside an 18th century bourgeois home. And so not only did they remove here sections of the building, but also they copied and replicated parts as if they were cut out. The paper will focus uh, especially on the theme of mirrors and how mirrors cut out uh, pieces uh, of uh, out of our vision. Um, and today I will mainly focus on that team, the team of mirrors and their work. Uh, so what I hope to do in the, the paper uh, is to apply uh, Lacan's theory of the gaze and the touche to come to grips with the team of absence in the work of uh, Ade DVT uh, in, uh, or Architects in the Belt of Italy. So in his 1964 seminar on the unconscious and repetition, Lacan says, of the unconscious that its true function is that of being in relation with the unbegrief or the, the grief or the, the cut or the un uh, that is constituted by wiederkeer or the return of a traumatic encounter with the real, um, what he also names at a certain point touche. Although he doesn't discuss the cut or the touche in a subsequent seminar on the gaze, he continues to speak of an absence of the central field in a picture called between the gaze and the subject of representation. So with the paper, I aim to investigate these ruptures and how they function as punctum or glitches in the play of representation and reproduction that condition architectural culture. A particular interesting uh, work is uh, this shop in Antwerp, uh, La Fille d'eau. Um, it's an interior design of uh, a shop for underwear. And it shows, uh, the design shows consideration for the existing specific qualities of the space, such as the marble walls, the checkerboard tile floor, the, the wooden desks, the wooden frames of the doors and, and you know, windows inside. In the middle of the interior uh, space, you see an apparatus or a dispositif of aluminum profiles that are positioned um, often in the middle of the, the space to which uh, clothes hangers and reflective surfaces are attached. So on the ceiling, you see neon lamps and the hue profiles that run parallel to these frames. So mirrors are positioned not uh, face to face with our reflection. They are positioned more in the line with our movement uh, in the interior space. The game starts already when we enter the, the shop uh, where the, the main front door on the left is covered with a mirror. 
in the two rooms of the, the two main rooms of the store, the mirrors are positioned at a precise point that is also occupied by the photographer uh, Philippe Dujardin to reflect almost imperceptibly the spaces that they hide. You see how the, the floor uh, pattern um, continues in the mirror images to complete the image of the original room. The reflection is almost mimetic. The mirror is positioned as a proof or verification of the sidelines of our perspective view. So like uh, Durer's uh, Lucinda or even better, the Tavoletta sort of device that was used in the Renaissance to check the construction of a perspective drawing. The viewer is invited to observe how the lines or the flight lines uh, of the mirror image coincide with the lines of the walls hidden behind it. So as the mirrors are only half the height of the room in the shot you see here, they invite such a judge in judgment. The illusion of the mirror only holds from a unique position. As the mirrors only cover part of the frame, they emphasize the constructive nature of the dispositive and the rupture between the perception of space and the image of perception that it produces. The operation of uh, the shop that I just showed of La, uh, La Fido reminds us of the Goldman and uh, Salatash uh, store of Vienna realized uh, around 1900 um, by Adolf Loos and uh, especially Beatrice Colomina's reading of, of it. The boat shops use the mirror to structure or rather deconstruct the architectural interior of a shop, shop to sell underwear for men in Loos' case, for women in the case of uh, the Velder. In a 1901 photograph in the magazine Des Interieurs, uh, we see a wall covered with large rectangular mirrors set with dark frames, some of, of which are fixed and others have doors opening onto other spaces. We see two evanescent uh, male figures occupy the same, uh, uh, the same wall, but the nature of this occupation is not clear. One of them seems to be standing at the threshold of an opening, his image reflected on the mirror door, perhaps also on the cabinet door on the right. Even more enigmatic is the other figure behind um, uh, in the right and uh, end of the picture, because only the upper part uh, of his body is visible. For Colmini, the real position of the figures in this photograph cannot be established. It is because architecture and photography speak in the same voice of the dissolution of physical space and with it that of the body of man at the dawn of modernity. Because according to Colomena, the architecture is a viewing mechanism that produces a subject that precedes and draws the identity of its occupant. The deconstruction of the unity of physical space slides towards the observation of the construction of the unity of the subject, male that inhabits it. Colomina's analysis also recognizes the performative power of photography with regard to those mirror architecture and their effects. Just as it used uh, devices to reduce the differences between openings and mirrors, the optical effect was reinforced, if not produced by the photographs themselves, which are only taken from the precise point where the effect occurs. Colomino solves this point by assuming on the one hand the involvement of Lowe's in their production, on the other hand, by conjuring up the architect um, form of criticism towards the idea of photography as a transparent medium. Thus, she writes, such frameworks undermine the referential status of the photographic image and its claim to represent reality as it is. Photograph leads the viewer's attention to the artifice involved in the photographic process. Like the drawings, they are not uh, representations in the traditional sense, they do not simply refer to a pre-existing object, but produce the object, they literally construct their object. In the pictures, uh, to go back to the, the case of La Fille d'eau, in the pictures by Philippe Dujardin, the globality of the architectural object is dismantled, as is the subject. The mirror is a screen that is the intersection of the cone of vision emanating from the subject and the gaze that emanates from the object. In the flipping between self-consciousness uh, uh, and a self-reflective architecture, the trompe l'oeil is also a domed regard. We are made conscious of seeing oneself see oneself, while the architecture object shows that architecture, the architecture of the real, cannot be represented but only be tamed in a photograph. 
the photograph is the frozen mirror. The photograph represents an architecture that seems to hide, but that shows that beyond the visuals, there is actually nothing. The architecture awaits the photograph, just as architecture is itself a dispositive like the camera. The architecture of uh, the Velder is certainly manneristic. It reveals its constructed nature. It shows the process of making architecture and of reflecting on architectural discourse. The architecture of the real is defined by the trauma that is that it cannot be represented. The photograph is not just a reproduction, but a repetition of this failure to represent the real. The touche or the punctum of the mirrors in the photograph are true matic holes that recall the missed encounter with the real. Our apprehension of coherence and the homogeneity of the space is continuously questioned. Tangible and reflective, reflective architecture are two complementary components of the architecture we witness. In the architecture of the Ville de Vintalieu, the meeting of both domains operates on the impossibility to distinguish their limits, the willful confusion of which, uh, which upholds the certainty of the notion of the real. So that's the draft material for the paper. So I will uh, stop here. And all comments are more than welcome. Thanks. Anybody have any comments? That's a, as curious, have, have the architects expressed uh, any intention in their architecture? They're, uh, no, they are quite opposed to, uh, to discourse. So they, discourse. They don't like to talk about their work, uh, which is particular, which is, somehow weird because their architecture is very mannerist. So it's it shows that it is all about, uh, it's acting on, it's willful to act on the discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially like the, the first project with the, the disconnected fragments scattered around on the wall, it looked a lot like a surrealist painting, <clears throat> like, a, like a Belgian surrealist painting. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah the the theme of surrealism is quite uh, present in their work uh, absolutely yeah um, it's very Magritte like so the yeah. um, there's no text in their architecture but uh, it's quite obvious that uh, uh, the, the the as in conceptual art uh, it's uh, it's both about concept image and texts that. Uh, are aligned in their architecture, uh, playing on uh, uh, presence and, and absence. Yeah. I, I especially like the uh, themes uh, of the of architecture constructing the subject, and of the self reflection of reason that that hides the abyss and the uh, unrepresented trauma. I, I thought those were very interesting themes in the architecture. Yeah, I'm, I'm now trying to. It's um, of course the, the the mirror and uh, the the photograph. They're sort of traps in themselves. Huh? <laughs> uh, they're you can, um, philosophically or theoretically speaking, but uh, there is a fascination uh, that you see in these offices, uh, also with. Um, in the work of uh, uh, Office Kerstin Kiers, the Viet van Seven, another Belgian office, and Eric Lapierre, a French office. Uh, Eric Lapierre has published a book on uh, uh, Architecture du Réel, Architecture of the Real. And I have the impression that um, um, what, for example, the, the discourse that Hal Foster uh, in his book, uh, The Return of the Real, developed, that there is a um, uh, fascination with the discourse that they elaborate in their architecture. Um, so that's a bit what I'm what I'm after here to to deconstruct. Um, does he talk uh, about? Does Hal Foster talk about those architects? No, not 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 at the moment. No. Yeah. Uh, any any more comments? So, so we'll have some maybe some brief comments after each one and then some more general comments uh, later on. 
Thanks, 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 thanks yeah. Luther. That's very interesting. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Francesco, are you there? Yes, apologies. Hello. Hi, if you could say a few words. About the Wooters presentation. Uh, about Wooters presentation or about your, your ideas for your for a topic? Oh, yeah. Um, well, in the first place, I'm, uh, I'm familiar with Don's work. I'm not familiar with Wooters work. And I really enjoy the his presentation, of course, and the, 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 the sorts of architecture he's been presenting. I was really fascinated. I would like to know more about it. Um, I'll, I'll go straight into my uh, my topic because I need to, to drive in a, in a minute. We are still in a, in a huge uh, a curfew, so I need to be home as soon as possible. Um, I haven't got uh, any presentation, unfortunately. I've been extremely busy, but still I want to take part in the, the, this, this, this symposium. Um, I'm working, I've been working since uh, quite a few years now on, on a topic, the, the relationship between subjectivity and the object, subject and object, which is quite Baudrillardian. Even though according to Baudrillard, the subject is disappearing in favor of the object. And this object was supposed to be the architecture, of course. And the, the research question was, we are all supposed to build around an you know, a, a architecture is supposed to be produced in relationship to a subject. Do we really know the subject or did we get disconnected entirely and completely from him? And therefore that was the point where Lacan came into play. And the first kind of things I was trying to ascertain was uh, what was the, the sorts of, now it's called organization of personality or such an object which we're supposed to build and create such a wonderful architecture, both at urban and, uh, and architectural level itself. And I came up with a sort of genealogy starting with the Renaissance, where I was interpolating mainly Baudrillard and Lacan and understanding how subjectivity has changed in relationship to the development of mercantilism first, and then, of course, moving into... Um, uh, moving into um, capitalism. I, I published already with, with, with Lawrence and yourself, John, the, the first two uh, chapters of this analysis that will later be expanded into book. And one was on, uh, the, 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 the theme is narcissism in, in the West, how it is reflected into the city. Uh, but the results of the, of the, the, the sorts of analysis is that uh, in the so-called classic age, that there's a sort of structuring of the personality, which is neurotic. And then we move into the pervert subject uh, after the first industrial revolution up until the end of modernism, World War II, and then with the advent of uh, federal capitalism, we move into um, psychosis or better said, ordinary psychosis. So what I'm putting into play for this third chapter, which is unwritten, but I published the first one on neurotics and the second one on the pervert subject, modernism. Um, it, um, what, what, what I'm putting into play is the relationship between um, <clears throat> uh, Lacan concept of ordinary psychosis, where it is more Jacques Alain Miller, but ordinary psychosis and uh, as an outcome to describe this relationship between the subject, the narcissist subject in the city, uh, Rem Collas notion of junk space and this idea that the architecture constantly rewrite itself. So I have developed an analogy between the idea of the, the unconscious as developed by uh, Lacan and this idea of the constant rewriting of architecture according to, to junk space or rancorous. But the subject of today's symposium would be the notion of the disappearance of the symbolic in um, Cassir, uh, Baudrillard, Lacan, and Aldo Rossi. I think they all are symptoms of something being felt. I don't know much about Cassir, unfortunately, and thanks the Lord that's done here, who can of course give me a few advice about it. Also, Angie has a huge um, knowledge about it. So I'm looking forward to listening what you have to say because I've just been reading and for the past two or three days, I only knew 
a few fragments has been applied to the study of American pop art, of which I'm a huge fan and analyst as well as related to postmodern architecture. But it was interesting while reading Cassir that he also believed in a sort of a anti-literum genealogical studies, possibly before the advent of post-structuralism that um, the developments of the, the symbolic forms of ideas uh, in the form of a myth come before the, the advent of science. So he sees this as a necessary stage before the, the, the disability of human mankind to have a more structured and objective approach to reality. If he wasn't, according to him, especially by going through politics, if he wasn't that, uh, there are still big gaps in this, in this ability that possibly capitalism has, but it doesn't necessarily mention capitalism in itself, to exploit the, the human subconscious to, to create a, well, we all know what, what happens, uh, to, to create this sort of an ideological approach to life. And therefore, the, I read just recently that uh, um, Hitler and the, the, the Nazi society were part of this sort of an art camp with the exploitation of the unconscious for the sake of keeping power. For the time being, all, as that, all that I have discovered is that there are big, huge differences in the notion of the symbolic in between the four. And I'm including in this Abbey Wall book, which also I've been analyzing in the past, it was also trying to, to um, uh, develop a sort of a genealogical approach to the developments of these archetypical myth uh, um, haunting uh, Western art, uh, uh, starting from uh, the legends of uh, the ancient Greeks uh, up until the most recent. And he had to stop himself by the, uh, by the second industrial revolution because uh, by the time uh, that um, by the time um, advertisement were, were exploiting these sorts of an approach to uh, these archetypes, of course, the, the, the combination and recombination of the, these such archetypes were so quick that it couldn't keep track of what was going on. Now, again, uh, I need to be quick because 10 minutes wouldn't be sufficient, especially because this is a completely unstructured presentation. But what I found out um, among the four or among the five the recurrent theme is that all of them are witnessing to a moment when something is happening in society. Um, Kassir laments the fact that, again, we are lost these big achievements of uh, relying on uh, science as uh, the, the best way to approach and understand reality or to create a sort of a relationship between the interior the symbolic forms and the external ones. But laments the, the, the symbolic as the previous form of reality in a very Nietzschean way of understanding it, which means all the time the, um, the approach to reality changes. So there's not a solid and objective understanding of reality it changes, but the previous organization was better than the ones we're having at the moment, because the one we're having at the moment is completely led by capitalism and is leading towards something that he didn't like. Same with Lacan and the capitalist discourse. Yeah. And I believe all these may come up in understanding better what is the relationship of the contemporary structure of subjectivity. In my previous chapter of these uh, developments, I made a very simple statement. I say that for the sake of the bourgeoisie, to take over the clergy and the monarchy, um, uh, medieval beliefs were challenged in order to prove that man is made in the image and resemblance of God. If this is true, then we don't need an intermediary in the ladder to prove that we deserve a better place in society according to our intelligence, for example, our creativity, et cetera, et cetera. And this to me ignites a sort of a process uh, where narcissism becomes uncontrollable. I don't use architecture directly to understand this mechanism. I use mainly uh, aesthetics and art, but it's interesting to see how this is reflected into architecture. So I'm mainly analyzing artists and their personality 
Renaissance up until now to understand what happens in architecture. So there are all these sorts of triangulation, but what stays in place is always what Baudrillard used to call, not an analogy, it is quite a, an architectural term, homology, which we derive from representation, at least in Italy, when we study um, geometry, descriptive geometry, we call it. So there was an homology according to the way in which uh, financial capitalism is structured and the way in which our society works. And therefore, again, I believe that in contemporary times, uh, the description that uh, Rem Collas gives of junk spaces is a perfect reflection of what is going on at the, at the moment. And now this reflects the, the, the organization towards the reality of Western subjectivity. Of course, I'm talking of a collective uh, organization of subjectivity. And of course, this may not be as spread as we believe, but in a sort of a way, it's an archety archetypical uh, sort of subjectivity that through globalization is reaching the rest of the world. Um, that's it. <laughs> it is simplistic and straightforward, but this is the point where, and it's necessary for me to go through these five characters to, uh, to have the evidence that actually um, something was detached and what is happening contemporary society to substantiate what Lacan was his perception of the way in which capitalism was changing the organization of society as we used to know it. We used to know it, sorry. Oh, very, very interesting. So, so I wonder if, uh, I wonder what the fate of psychoanalysis is. Will it can it? Yeah. Can it, uh, well, the, 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 just just because you ask, and just would like to add this. I, I was reading again the discourse of the capitalist from Lacan. He was suggesting that possibly through psychoanalysis, to be psychoanalyzed, to going through psychoanalytical training, everybody should become a psychoanalyst to stop this process. Oops. Today, the battery is dying as well. Um, so becoming a psychoanalyst, at least understanding what uh, being a psychoanalyst of psychoanalyst entails would help become a more self-aware of the situation and therefore in a certain way, do something about the, um, the current state of affairs. Uh, Baudrillard was much more radical towards this position and Something I'm wondering by myself is all previous generations, some, some of the people were extremely skeptical of the changes occurring. So I wonder whether we just react in something that shouldn't be stopped at all. Maybe should just be witnessed and see whether it's going through or whether these, the changing happening in the past 50, 70 years are totally unprecedented and do not uh, fall within, a, and here I can put down again, doesn't fall within something that the, the, the constant recycling of history has been uh, for, foreseen by Vico uh, is actually happening. Uh, according to Baudrillard, in fact, we are stuck in a sort of a endless continuum where we have the impression that changes are happening, but actually nothing is happening. Uh, to, to somebody else, in, instead we're spinning towards something um, unconceivable. So I don't know. I'm, this is part of my research at the moment. I can't tell more because I'll be working on this during the summer. Done. Perhaps uh, in, in not too distant future, psychoanalysis will be disregarded as another repressive ideology. I, 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 I agree with it. It could be, it's, it's interesting, especially because now um, neurosciences are, are emerging. I would like to know what neuroscience has to say about uh, Cassir's positions about the symbolic forms, because some of these ontological question that Cassir uh, asks, and, and again, maybe Don can answer this. I, I was wondering, did he read Freud at all, or was it just coming straight, straight from uh, Kantian or a neo-Kantian position or a Gillian position? Because sometimes the, the, the impression it didn't interpolate within his crisis about the unconscious, but again, put for thought. Yeah, and Andy was supposed to tell us about neuroscience today, but he's not here. 
Any other comments? I'll just throw in something. Um, Kassira actually had a uh, had a couple of interesting uh, things to say about um, neuroscience of his day, <clears throat> because he was he was using the work of Gelbin Goldstein, who were looking at uh, brain damage of uh, soldiers in World War One, and um, actually formulated the basis for Jakobson's theory of metaphor versus metonymy. Um, basically saying that the lesions in the brain created one of two conditions. Either you lost your sense of contiguity, um, how things go together. So if you're looking at a hand, how are all my fingers in one hand? Uh, or you lost your sense of semblance, which is your ability to recognize uh, human faces, uh, resemblance, things like that. Um, so it, it's very interesting to think that that, that Jakobsen and others almost never go back to this original neurological data that Kassira took very seriously. Um, uh, it, I don't know, some, something yet to be ex explored, I suppose. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Francesco. Uh, Don, it's your turn. Don right. Frenzy is Professor Emeritus at Penn State University. Okay, let's see what I can pull up here. Tim, Tim are you there? It'd be, it'd be nice to see your face. I have to... <laughs> I, have I to am here. One set of controls out of the way to get to another set of controls. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I've just been working on a project about the Noli plan, so I've been... Uh, my head's been up my butt on figure ground relationships. I'll just throw this in because as you know, the Noli plan is a kind of figure ground relationship showing the, um, uh, the, the spaces of the streets and the piazzas and interiors of large buildings as if they were one continuous network. Um, th this figure ground thing is, is more, there's more to it than meets the eye. Um, so, my contention was we can go all the way back to the neuroscience of uh, what happens when we sleep, uh, where th there's a kind of funny thing that goes on. The body must be paralyzed um, during non-REM speech, uh, sleep. Um, so technically speaking, uh, it has to be the case that the dream actually moves around the dreamer uh, and not the dreamer uh, around the dream as, as the dreamer believes firmly. Otherwise, we wouldn't have it. But here's, here's a little uh, intro to my project. Um, I'm very taken with what Mladen Dollar says in a kind of challenge essay that he wrote uh, a couple of years back that he wants to take anamorphosis um, to uh, talk about everything in psychoanalysis. Uh, it's quite striking for any of us who are in visual fields uh, to hear this claim being made that, that we could actually take anamorphosis to everything in psychoanalysis. Um, I, I, I sort of got on the bandwagon of how to actualize this project. Um, my idea is to take it uh, through a more general channel uh, of passivity uh, in order to uh, broaden the domain so that we understand a great variety of things in terms of a kind of latency um, that articulates what Jijic calls in a 2004 podcast that he did. Uh, not many people seem to have seen this, but it's a very interesting one where he, he inverts the term um, virtual reality and he talks about a reality of the vir uh, virtual. Uh, and here he articulates a kind of uh, new category of Aristotelian cause, a kind of um, effectiveness um, of things, that the secondary virtuality is really the unseen uh, mechanics behind things that gets them to work, to be what they are. Uh, so when we're looking at things like subjects and objects, um, naturally we find that the Lacan is vastly disruptive um, in the same way that I think Kassir and Vico were, that we think we can stabilize our idea of the subject and the object, but we find that not only theory forces us to 
reevaluate uh, these as categories, in fact, give them up as categories. Um, but history itself shows this instance where um, the instability of these terms uh, gives rise to new cultural formations. Um, but let's just start where, where Mladen Dollar starts and where Lacan seems to start when he talks about anamorphosis. Um, the sudden emergence in the 16th century of all kinds of art that makes use of this privilege of viewpoint. Um, we, we've seen this painting until we're ready to throw up, I'm sure. Every, everybody just can't stand it anymore. Um, but it's remarkable to me that uh, there was a study done about 10 years ago by a guy named uh, John North, who uh, was inexplicably the only person to walk around the painting and see what was on the other side. Um, and when he did this, he found that there was a date inscribed, um, April 11th, 1533, 4 p.m. And, and John North basically uh, did a double take and said, what's this 4 p.m.? Uh, you know, you don't finish a painting on a certain minute and, you know, like, and then hold your vernissage, you know, to celebrate it. Uh, what's this 4 p.m.? And he found out that there was, um, as, as the painter Holbein is telling us in the painting, there's every instrument he could drag out of the closet and put on that table that has to do with navigation, uh, timing, location, uh, precision and geometry as it relates to the world. And then to top it all off as if a cherry uh, on the top of the cream soda, uh, he gives us a point defined by the skull uh, so that the viewer himself or herself <clears throat> is implicated by the anamorphic perception of the skull image and a, a kind of hyper geometric uh, linkage of all of these factors, including uh, the, the visible horizon, um, the, the Christian uh, acknowledgement of the crucifix that's uh, half covered by the curtain, uh, the position of Golgotha, which is the place of, of the viewer when <laughs> the viewer sees the skull. So all kinds of crazy things are going on that John North pointed out. Um, I don't think <coughs> any of it at all refutes uh, anything that, that Lacan was saying about it but I think it opens it up. Um, first of all, this date uh, shows that, that when Holbein was uh, painting, he was uh, in contact with Luca Pacioli, who was a famous geometer, uh, mathematician, and astrologer of the day. So everyone in his circle was convinced that this specific time would be the, the last moment uh, on Earth, of course, if if Holbein finished painting it, he would have disproved his thesis. But his basic idea uh, went so far as to say that at 4 p.m., the sun over the horizon in London was going to be exactly 27 degrees above the horizon, the same angle that he had set for the anamorphic perception of the skull, uh, the same angle that connects all of the other things uh, in the painting including the other side of the painting. Uh, so it's, it's a, a, a kind of thesis that, that Lacan seems to have only understood half of it, um, but the other half kind of uh, is a hyper confirmation of what Lacan's already saying about it. Um, and, and Lacan even refers to this uh, kind of weird um, virtuality of the painting's history itself. He says, what was, what was anamorphosis before it was anamorphosis? That is before uh, the 1500s, well, what must have been going on? You know, it can't have just popped out of nowhere, but certainly it didn't pop out in this form until we see these images stretched, stretched across uh, the convict walls. Um, but to go back to my, my thesis of uh, uh, figure ground, I, I always like to do something that's so totally idiotic that I open myself up to um, the, the claim that I'm an idiot. And, and I'm, half of the time I'm agreeing with that claim, um, but other, other times I want to test it as a kind of ersatz conjecture. I, I, I believe you have to say something stupid just to see where things go wrong. Um, and, and in the dream, um, my ersatz conjecture is that 
uh, if it is true that the, that the sleeper is paralyzed, but the dreamer continues to imagine moving around in space, what actually is going uh, on with the figure ground relationship? Um, so mm -hmm. here, here's, a, here's a really idiotic movie to confirm my really idiotic thesis. Um, I hope you've seen it before, The Truman Show by Peter Weir, uh, a 1998 film um, is about uh, a guy, uh, Jim Carrey plays him, uh, Truman, who is the only person in this uh, uh, stupid uh, North Florida um, gated community town um, that's very famous in architectural circles uh, for many of the same reasons it's used in the Truman Show to exemplify a kind of prison that um, makes you think of the three prisoners dilemma. Um, that is, you have to figure out what's wrong with you by looking at other people and figuring out what's wrong with them. Uh, in the Truman Show, uh, Truman, the naive uh, non-actor is surrounded by actors and a uh, giant apparatus that makes sure that he never discovers the truth about a situation. Uh, so he's raised as a, a little infant uh, all the way through adulthood without ever realizing that there's a world beyond uh, seaside Florida. Uh, so if, if we actually draw this out, Truman's illusion that he's moving around a space like a figure over a ground is, is actually false. Actually, it's the ground that's moving across Truman. So everything that he believes to be true is actually produced by the apparatus. And it's a good time to go back and reread that essay by Agamben on uh, the dispositive. Um, so when I, when I take this further, I, I, I run into something that links Lacan with Kassirer because both of them use this idea of analysis. Um, in fact, Pappus is the very gentleman who gives psychoanalysis half of its name. Uh, analysis is not <clears throat> exactly the, uh, uh, the kind of ordinary meaning of the term analysis, like I'm analyzing my, my, uh, my monthly electrical bill to figure out how I can save some money. It's, it's an analysis that comes specifically from, from the ancients, from Plato and an Aristotle who used it, uh, but especially analysis as associated with geometry. Um, it is a two-part deal. And, and this is where it gets interesting. Analysis is one half of a process that includes a necessary synthesis. And, and the way Pappas describes it is in terms of something going downstream and then having to go back upstream. Uh, that in synthesis, you retrace yourself uh, in what you did in analysis. You retrace your steps. Um, but also you have to imagine that entropy of thinking gets reversed. This is a, a radical conception. Uh, now it's interesting that um, it had two basic uh, implications for theory. The first was chemical where analysis was taken, but synthesis was generally disregarded. This was the side that Freud took. Uh, and so most of the psychoanalysis, um, analysis and psychoanalysis is meaning the kind of analysis that chemists do. However, Lacan understood analysis to, to be very synthetic and retroactive. And so the whole idea of, uh, of Lacanian psychoanalysis really emphasizes Freud's knox trigley kite uh, and makes a big deal out of retroaction and the après coup and illustrates all of it in terms of projective geometry. Um, now, an interesting feature of uh, Pappas as, as a, an intellect is that he also invented projective geometry. So Lacan is making a double connection when he uses the term analysis. He's going back to Pappas in terms of uh, the way analysis is always paired with synthesis. And he's also going back to projective geometry to prove his points. Um, so when you put the two together, you really get an interesting compound that uh, means that in psychoanalysis, uh, we have moments that connect both uh, topologically um, 
and analytically with, with a kind of treatment program that combines both analysis, analysis and synthesis in a way that um, we see that the, uh, the L schema in particular uh, activates this. So I tried to look at the L schema as like a, uh, an interactive dynamic diagram. And I know you're all familiar with this until you're, it's, it's worse than Holbein, you know, you just can't take it anymore. Uh, but as you know, the, uh, the position of the S, the unbarred subject, um, is, is used to construct a, a, what's called here a wall of language. That is um, two people sitting in a room, an analyst and an analyst and both as egos are talking to each other, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, the, the analyst is listening carefully for uh, those classic slips of the tongue or gaps or inconsistencies that the analyst is going to make. Um, in this, we are able to dissect a difference between demand, which is literally um, the repetitions of the analyst and um, the, the ways in which there's a kind of internal symmetry uh, to this blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's a symmetry that connects in a kind of toroid fashion, at least according to Lacan, in the way that the uh, spiral itself curves around and connects to itself. It's self-intersection. This is a topological uh, feature of projective geometry. In trying to make sense of this, I, I obsessively deal with Nachtreglichkeit, uh, the apre coup, um, in, in the way it tries to say, as, as Lacan says, we don't know what's no, no. Hi, <laughs> we, we, uh, we don't know what's primary until we encounter what's secondary. That is, when we find something that's secondary, we realize, oh, you know, who's counting? I didn't know we were counting. If we're counting, then this is secondary. There must be something that's primary. So our, our, our reconstruction of the real is always retroactive. Uh, construction of, of, of something that, that seems impossibly to have happened before. As, as Oscar Levant said um, in a, a funny quip, who, I knew Doris Day before she was a virgin. Uh, that is, what we, what we take to be first is actually prefaced by something that in a very real sense is, is, is not just hypothetically, but really first. Um, so this idea of not just an efficient cause, but an effective cause uh, as topological necessarily becomes a geometrical issue of effective cause uh, of, of being self-intersecting and non-orienting. So coupling analysis and synth synthesis uh, not only helps us with uh, Lacan's relation uh, to this idea of analysis, uh, but it connects us to other people such as Kassir who are using exactly the same kind of, of, of methodology coming out of Pappas. Um, I just throw this in because I just, I, I can't resist it. Uh, this is a backwards version of Tati's playtime. The point of comparing oh, the Mobius shoot, hold on. insertion of slow. Oh, I, I should have cut out the sound on that. Um, I'll go back and get rid of the sound. Uh, if I can, I have to take it over. But you see the distinction between the two uh, paintings. There is... Um, takes forever to get rid of the something here. Yeah, okay. No volume at all. Gotcha. Oops. That uh, in very modern examples, we're, we always take Tati's uh, films to be critiques of modernism. Uh, Mononc, uh, uh, La Vacance de Monsieur Hudeau, um, all of these things uh, basically long for the era of uh, the French Republic. Um, when, when life was simpler and slower and, 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 and uh, it's a kind of phenomenological critique to be honest about it. Um, but, but he's using precisely the same kind of spatial divisions that, that topologically connect to things that uh, 
I find to be active in Piero uh, in the flagellation of Christ. There's the same division and combination of something in the foreground with something running in the background, but it's put adjacent rather than uh, the typical ploy of putting it uh, going on in the on the very background. Um, so this is a little bit of where I am. I'm hoping to um, to employ some Kassir in trying to uh, bring together these uh, these theme themes of, of topology. I find that the topology is not just uh, difficult for me. Uh, almost uh, every other Lacanian I run across um, has trouble with projective geometry in one form or another. Um, so I. <laughs> I think doing something like reading seminar nine, which is just going to make your head hurt, but it's absolutely necessary uh, to see Lacan's rather refined distinctions uh, about projective geometry that allow us to connect him with um, a broad range of, of uh, visual arts, um, cultural phenomenon, um, and, and modern things like uh, Jacques Tati and the use here of the fourth wall. Uh, so I'll just uh, pull it to a close there and, and see what you have to say. Thank you, Don. Very Thank interesting. You, so I think you, you and uh, Francesco both seem to be building around the, uh, the subject object relation. Yeah, very true. So I was, I was, I was just wondering uh, when I was looking at the ambassadors uh, about the skull. I mean, the the skull uh, on the rock of Golgotha before the be below the cross is is generally taken to be the skull of Adam, to yeah. to, to symbolize that uh, that's the purpose of the crucifixion is so that Christ can redeem mankind from the uh, sin of Adam, and and the, the suffering that that we're uh, then propelled into. So I, I wonder if uh, I was just wondering if that plays a, a role in uh, Holbein's uh, painting. If there's a, maybe a commentary about humanism uh, as being the suffering that we've <laughs> been <laughs> condemned to, and 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 also uh, uh, just thinking maybe you know really, Francesco brought this up, this sort of underlying uh, element of religion. I, I wonder if there's even an, uh, an underlying uh, element of religion in uh, playtime. <laughs> Oh, Playtime is the most Catholic movie you can watch. Believe me. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm so happy you, you brought up this thing about the skull being the skull of Adam. Um, it, it, the real question here is how come, um, how come we're looking at a skull of Adam when we're seeing that skull? Um, Adam is supposed to be an immortal. And uh, that's what he's promised in paradise. And of course, he breaks the covenant and he becomes mortal. He becomes a sexuated being. And I, th I think all of Lacanian psychoanalysis can be shoved in a nutshell and you can write on the outside of it. This is about sexuated being, not about any other kind of subjectivity. Uh, so this is why um, Lacan sees Freud's interest in sexuality is a true universalizing feature. Um, Lacan, I think, takes it appropriately to the phenomenon of language, where uh, the difference between the immortal atom and the mortal atom is something that Lacan uh, gives a specific name to. He calls it by univocal concordance. In, in heaven or paradise, Adam can point at something and name it, and it comes into being. There's a perfect indexicality between the name of a thing uh, and the thing itself. And so this is the being that we uh, lose when we become speaking beings. Uh, and, and we drain off the being, not only of ourselves, but the being of objects in the world uh, with every investment we make in subjectivity um, in, a, in a, pro, a kind of uh, fixed, uh, <laughs> what's it called, a fixed sum, yeah, a fixed, uh, that is whatever I gain, you lose, that, that, that kind of game. Um, everything that's, that's, that's pulled off by the libido uh, is lost by being. Uh, 
and, and, and this is the kind of mathematics we're caught up in. Uh, so the dynamic uh, is then transferred to language. So we have language, uh, unfortunately, deprived of being. Language now uh, has divested itself, thanks to the mirror stage, uh, to a, a relationship um, with the real and can only reveal the real through uh, cracks or angles or prismatic relationships, um, which, which I think uh, is, this is the foundation of works of art, particularly those, uh, those works that are labeled as, as meta, um, meta works, meta works of genius, meta theoretical works, such as Las Meninas, uh, which of course Lacan comments on, um, but also I would include uh, Demoiselle d'Avignon, um, I always include Holbein, uh, the painting of the Tower of the ba of Babel. Um, these these are meta theoretical in in their attempt to paint both sides of the canvas, or uh, paint not only the world that appears behind the canvas projectively, but the world in front of it, uh, to address both of those realities as this as if they're coming back together in that formation, uh, people in architectural world known as the, uh, the tessera, uh, the token that, that combines perfectly in a one-to-one -one fashion. So we recover bivalent, by univocal concordance through arts, um, rather obsessive, and I would say psychotic, because I, I, I love what Francesco is getting into here, the idea that ordinary psychosis can uh, provide windows onto the real um, through through failures in the symbolic. Uh, so you know what the hell are we doing with the paternal signifier? Let's eclipse it for a moment of ordinary psychosis and experience this uh, tessera situation where the painting um, or the mirror, as as in uh, Vuter's example, I thought that was fascinating. Um, the architect who had taken the things that are normally invisible um, within an architectural space um, and return them in a fragmentary way, uh, seemingly divorced of such things as gravity, divorced of the picture plane, uh, divorce of authorial intention. You know, why is the architect putting this up here <laughs> when it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't belong there? So all of these things out of place are fascinating attempts to recover what is, in a sense, that skull at the base of uh, the crucifix. Fascinating. Uh, any other comments? So I, ha I have an abstract to read, another 10 minutes. So I'll do that. It'll be a huge anti-climax after these uh, great uh, abstracts that have been read, uh, and then and then oh. we'll, uh, have a concluding discussion. So there's my uh, image. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Uh, so my abstract is called Desire and Perception and Language. Desire for Lacan as it is manifest in the mechanisms of language is the attempt to attain or understand that which is missing from the being of the subject, which is the objet a, as, as Don just established that uh, being is excluded from language. The objet a, the petite objet a, is that around which desire circulates, that upon which fantasy is constructed, and that which is the product of méconnaissance. It is that which is excluded by signification and language, that of which the subject is deprived as it is solidified into a signifier in language. The elided subject in signification and the divided subject in language are the result of that which the subject can no longer be in rational discourse. The objet a is present in, quote, uh, the existence of everything that the ego neglects, scotomizes, misconstrues, and the sensations that make it react to reality, everything that it ignores, exhausts, and binds, and the significations that it receives from language, 
as Lacan famously said in Aggressivity and Psychoanalysis. The desire of the big other of Lacan, the desire of the subject of language is transferred to the desire of the other, the other person or object, the object of desire. The object is objectified by the subject to compensate for its lack, the objet a. The objet a is the residue of the dialectic between the imaginary and symbolic, the conflict between the identity of the subject as it is defined by its imaginary ego and object identification, and the identity of the subject as it is defined by the symbolic in its insertion into the big other, the matrix of language and relationships, and the demands that the big other makes of the subject in relation to its phenomenal and imaginary experience. The demands of the symbolic are manifest in the unconscious as the discourse of the big other, to which the subject does not have access in itself, but which constitute the unknowable foundation of the conscious activities and thoughts of the subject. As the subject enters into the symbolic, into the signifying chain of language, the psyche of the subject is fragmented and the experience of the body is divided in the gestalt ego identification resulting from the mirror stage, the objet a is that experience of the unified body of the subject, which is rendered impossible by language. The principal categories of Lacanian psychoanalysis and the structuring of the psyche are the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real. Just a sort of Lacan primer. The imaginary refers to perceived or imagined images in conscious and unconscious thought. The symbolic refers to the signifying order, signifiers, and language which determine the subject. The construction of the perceived image in conscious and unconscious thought and the role that the image plays in both language and reason is the subject of both architectural design and Lacanian psychoanalysis. The language of architectural composition is a meta-language in relation to language itself and shares its basic structure. Like the spoken or written language, the language of architecture combines the image with its organization and insertion into a syntax. The images which are perceived in architecture are always given to the subject in perception in a symbolic matrix, which might be seen as the big other of Lacan, the matrix of language and laws into which the subject is inserted, which is unperceived by the subject. According to Lacan in the essay, The Mirror Stage, the mirror stage is a drama whose internal dynamic shifts from insufficiency to anticipation, a drama that for its subject caught in the mirage of spatial identification, which is, I was thinking about that one, um, uh, Don was talking, the, uh, the uh, lure of the, the trap of spatial identification, vehiculates a whole series of fantasies which range from a fragmented image of the body to what we will term an orthopedic form of its unity and to that ultimate assumption of the armature of an alienating identity whose rigid structure will mark the subject's entire mental development, Lacan says. The specular image of the infant is in contrast to prior sense experience already before it is conceptualized in the symbolic, which constitutes an organic discord in the infant as well as an inorganic one. The form of the body is fixed in the mirror by the infant in contrast with the turbulent movements that the subject feels are animating him, movements which are precluded by the structure of language. The movements are constituted by phantoms, phantasms, hallucinations, dreams, the products of mental mechanisms and perception, language, memory, and imagination. The organic discord in the infant is a sign of or, an organic insufficiency in its natural reality as described by Lacan as the concept of nature is given in the symbolic. The relation of the subject to nature is as a result of the self-consciousness brought about by the specular identification, quote, altered by a certain dehiscence at the heart of the organism, a primordial discord betrayed by the signs of uneasiness and motor uncoordination of the neonatal months. Many organic forms in nature, nuts for example, or pods or anthers, have seams built into them to allow for a natural dehiscence or splitting apart. The formation of the subject is profoundly influenced by the primordial dehiscence and its effect is principally seen in the mirror stage where, quote, caught up in the lure of spatial identification, the succession of fantasies that extends from a fragmented body image is transformed into a totality that I shall call orthopedic, Lacan says, which assumes the role of the armor of an alienating identity, which will mark with its rigid structure the subject's entire mental development. Uh, 
I think I'll stop there. I was going to say some things about Freud, but that's enough for today. Keep it till the con. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. That's nice. So, uh, concluding comments, remarks. Have we accomplished anything today? I, I think it's a good start. All very interesting discussions. I think it's a really good start, John. Um, I would I would like you to write a book titled Orthopedics, and and uh, of course have it to be all about Lacan. Um, so it would sell a lot of copies by people who never looked beyond the cover. Uh, but could you could you enlarge that? Uh, I was thinking, you know, Lacan's famous for saying that the the human child is woefully unprepared to uh, to meet the world, and therefore extends childhood uh, up to the point and beyond it, uh, where the mirror stage informs the child that uh, he's woefully inadequate in symbolic terms. Um, that, that's uh, Andy's argument for what makes the human being different from any other animal. Yeah. Can can you align the body? I mean, it seems like it's very tempting at this point to say that the university discourse is a kind of roadmap for what happens after the mirror stage. That is, we regard knowledge as a way of fulfilling a gap um, in our being. Um, but I think there are other alternatives. I, I, I think you can look at the other discourses as also ways of filling in the gaps uh, or supplementing. Um, but, but certainly uh, it goes back and forth between thinking of the body as an image, as an as, uh, emblem of the subject, as something to be satisfied in one way in which uh, uh, the intellect cannot be. Um, it's, it seems like appetite is, is pulled into there. I just love to see um, some kind of lengthy study based on this idea of orthopedics, pulling in all of those themes. I think the, yeah, I think, you know, university discourse is one among many uh, of ways in which uh, people try to uh, reclaim the uh, inaccessible uh, being. And I, I think the, the, the important thing to me uh, about the mirror stage is that, you know, because of the mirror stage, <coughs> any, in, in after uh, the mirror stage, any, any perception uh, that you have has to be mediated by language. The, I think that's the key point. They're, they're after the mirror stage, there, there is no such thing as an unmediated perception, which, which is what the phenomenolo phenomenologists claim. I mean, that's the basis of phenomenology, is that exists. And Lacan says, no, it doesn't. That, that, that uh, any, any perception uh, has to be mediated by, by language. Uh, in the symbolic, the dialectic of the symbolic and the imaginary. Uh, so that, you know, that, that uh, is in relationship to anything involving perception, involving the body, involving motor coordination. Uh, it, it, it's all, uh, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not direct uh, for the subject. Uh, it's, it's constructed by, uh, pre-constructed by, and mediated by uh, language. I think that's key. And that's sort of a, you know, I mean, it sort of relates to idealism, you know, that's somewhat of an idealist position. Uh, Lacan, you know, rejected idealism uh, because uh, he rejected the, the uh, possibility of the subject, right? But like a lot of things that Lacan or Freud reject, uh, it plays a role, I think. So and it, it relates to, you know, uh, neuroscience and cognitive science. I, I, I mentioned that cognitive scientists all say that in order to have a perception of something, to have a percept, you have to construct it uh, in your head first, you know, which would take us back to Berkeley and the sort of absolute idealism uh, of Berkeley. But for me, that's the key. Uh, that's what psychoanalysis tells us. Uh, and that's uh, how you know, we need to understand our experience of reality uh, and how architects uh, need to understand uh, their experience of reality uh, in the making of architecture. And you know, the, in, in the understanding of architecture, 
and the allowing of architecture to play a role uh, in this relationship between what is perceived and what is constructed in our minds. Uh, could I could I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, Wal Walter, um, I really enjoyed your uh, paper and your uh, pictures. And um, I'm wondering, I mean, you say that these architects uh, don't say anything. Yeah, they're just, yeah, yeah. Very they're, very they're silent about their work. Very, well, yeah, more than is, uh, than other architects, uh, yeah, I would say they this sort of resistance yeah, against discourse. Yeah, I, I find that interesting. So what, 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 you know, what do you do in that situation? And I think the other thing was that the the pictures uh, of the spaces there was nothing in them. There was no products. There was it was just the commercial space before it was filled and turned in, you know, made useful as it were. Yes, there was an existing space and they uh, uh, refurnished it. Um, but uh, what is fascinating is that uh, I think is that the mirrors are positioned so that you don't see the, the viewer. Um, it's uh, positioned according to how you move into space. Um, so when you move, you see space moving in the mirror, but you don't see yourself in the mirror. That's correct. And the, the mirrors are positioned in such a way that they mirror the other part of the room that becomes invisible through the mirror. So the mirror hides one half of the room, but that's the part you actually see in the mirror. Okay. I don't... It's so if you, yeah, if the mirror is positioned in the middle of the room, yeah, yeah it hides one half of the room. Right. When you look into the mirror, you see the half of the room that's hidden. But at the same time, the mirror doesn't is not like a wall. It's only half of the walls. So it's from the ceiling of, of, almost to the ceiling to to the almost uh, waist uh, height, the height of the waist. So you see that it's a constructed. Um, so there's this, yeah, always the, that play in, uh, so I, I think, I think Don expressed it very well. Uh, I think Don, uh, when talking now about the, um, sort of meta theoretical view of, uh, showing the world, uh, before the screen and the world behind the picture screen. Uh, I think that's the, the play going on uh, there. Do they achieve this illusion by putting behind you something that is a mirror image of what is in front of you, but you can't see? Um, How is it the mirror shows you what's behind the mirror? It's because of the, the positioning of the mirror in the, the room. Um, but it only holds on specific viewpoints that then yeah. the photographer takes. So it doesn't work all the time, of course, but from yeah. specific viewpoints, the, the, the flight lines of perspective, they continue and the, the patterns of the floor as well. And so that's, uh, of course, the, 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 the point of view that the photographer takes. So it's the architecture also presumes that the viewpoint will be taken by the photographer and that the image will then circulate and will be uh, reproduced in, in architectural media. But so as you move uh, around, as, a, as you move around, the mirror doesn't do that, but then you get to the point where it does and you can continue to move and then it stops again. So you, you, yeah. you get this sense of a particular point of in the particular space in the room where exactly. there's this kind of concordance that where it does, the 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 lie all suddenly tells the truth, but it's yeah, still so not the truth. It, it is so. It's a sort of trompe but at the same time, it's sort of uh, yeah. The notion uh, isn't 
I uh, I take from account that a, a dump trade guy, so it's it's clear that it is uh, also a uh, point of view that is expected to be taken by the media. So it's sort of intermedial architecture. It's uh, it is not only about the viewer, it's also about how these images will circulate in, in media, I think, uh, and in discourse. And um, um, it's, it's quite mannerist in that sense that it's uh, uh, reflecting on uh, the state of the, the architectural debate. It's yes. also yeah, operating it's on these various... Manner, mannerist, I, I rather like that. It, as mm. Plato's pointed out way back at, when, mirrors, the image that is reflected in a mirror is, is backwards. So that's not, it's never going to be reality. But, but do the architects say that they've created this in order for it to be circulated in the media? Or do they say that it's something you must really come and experience for yourself? It, that becomes clear because of the other work they do. Um, for example, in, in at the Venice Biennials or in other exhibitions they do, um, they, re, for, um, for example, of um, a Caritas uh, elderly uh, 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 house renovation day in the, at the Venice uh, Biennial, they use the same materials to construct uh, sort of frames that then uh, into which they put the pictures. So the, the pictures then become walls. So there, there is sort of reversals going on. Um, so they, they often construct work that they then know will be exhibited or there. Uh, so it's, and, and that's something you, you see in all other uh, uh, architectural practices you now uh, as well in uh, in Belgium sometimes that uh, these uh, uh, architects they uh, want to act on on um, on how architecture figures in the media how, on the repre uh, representation of architecture. I think that's that's interesting that uh, yeah that there's sort yeah. of doubling as well uh, uh, there. Uh, yeah, it, it makes them easier to, to project an analysis onto. I mean, architects like, you know, Eisenman and Coolhouse that won't shut up. I mean, it makes it a lot harder to uh, project any analysis onto them. I, I like, I thought, I thought, Tim, you were going to say something about the architects being autistic. Uh, uh, what I like about this theme of autism that I hope you keep pushing is that, um, there is a uh, temptation to domesticate that people with language abilities um, that are fully socialized are, are able to handle. That is, we can domesticate a mirror uh, thanks to the fact that when we look into it, um, it seems to get things wrong. It has the left on the right and the right on the left. Fine. Then we just say, oh, it's just a reflection. You know, I can, I'm, I'm not going to be tricked by a mirror. But, but we, find that, that that domestication attempt falls short. There are some cultures that require mirrors to be covered uh, on the instance of a death in the family. There are all kinds of beliefs about mirrors uh, that exceed their bounds, that there's something inside the mirror that is not hidden. And of course, we have Las Meninas, which is you know, like the tour de force on mirror magic. Um, but if we go back to this theme of domestication, um, what I put in the notes there is they can make mirrors that reflect the right to the right and the left to the left rather than reversing it. And people find them absolutely intolerable. They can't have them in their house. They are able to domesticate the, 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 the wrong mirror, so to speak. But, uh, but when a mirror actually shows you what you look like, it's, it's, it's too much of a rivalry. Um, so. If we go back to this idea of domestication, I think Wouter's really uh, raising some interesting stuff. Um, and, and as John was talking about this, this, the way in which parametric architecture was sort of actualizing these um, 
I kind of, I looked at that building and I thought that's just a demand structure. You know, it's a repetition of of, of repetitions, of uh, so, cycling and recycling. Uh, in fact, it's actually made by an algorithm that precisely recycles uh, the same data over and over again. Um, as, as if to say that we can draw the line um, um, around our expectations of what we regard our uh, body to demand in terms of repetition. That is, we, we, we wake up in the morning and we know it's us. It's the same person who went to sleep. Um, we leave the house and we come back home. It's the same house that we left. You know, maybe maybe a chimpanzee or something got in and messed it up, but it's still the same house. That is, our 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 demand for domestication is something that art continually plays with. And so, I when Vuter was talking about mirrors, I immediately thought of uh, Magritte's "Not to Be Reproduced." which has the guy looking in the mirror and the mirror's image is turned backwards. I'm sure you, you've all seen that before. But the issue here goes directly to this idea of, of, um, of the uncanny, where if we take it back to the idea, the raw idea of what's homely and non-homely and, and the idea of a kind of movable margin of domesticating and, and see that as easily disrupted, easily distorted. Um, and in the, in, in the case of uh, obsessive compulsives, such as myself, you know, we come back in and find something out of place, we're outraged. You know, our whole world is threatened if, uh, if we don't find things as we left them. Uh, so it, it does seem that there's, there's a tilt here uh, uh, away from uh, just looking at these things as, as clever applications of the architectural imagination and looking at the, the idea of ordinary psychosis. Um, I'm going to kill Andy when I get a hold of him, wring his neck, because I think he could weigh in here effectively uh, about this margin of the symbolic. Uh, as John says, we, we learn how to be symbolic beings at the mirror stage. But not all of us get the full lesson or do it correctly. And, and our lessons wear out uh, and, and, and we're, we're always messing up. We're always undermining our own happiness. We're always uh, falling short of saying what we mean or saying too much. So I'm not gonna oh, say Walter, I, uh, I, I look forward, Walter, to, um, I mean, I, I, there's, there's evidence out there, isn't there? There's evidence to to consider in in the face of the silence of your architects and their claim that they are doing it for the camera. Yeah, that that, that would seem like interesting propositions, but maybe not yet enough evidence. You know. They have, yeah, they, the evidence they show is more on the, the level of drawing and the visual uh, than the, the textual. Yeah. 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 What can be made of the evidence rather than just grabbing for the first uh, bit of theory that pops into your head, you know, stick with the evidence. You know, that's what I liked about what you were doing. You know? Yes, yes, you came, it's, you came um, with a conundrum. You came with a, a problem, you know? What do we do with it? Yeah, absolutely. And see what what can we do with uh, Lacan's theory? To what extent can we be mobilized to, to let it uh, speak? Yeah. I think it brings up a, an interesting uh, question about the relationship between intentionality and in architecture and its analysis and criticism. I mean, there's a, there's a possibility that if you sat down with these architects, the, they would tell you they've, they've never heard of Jacques Lacan, they have no interest in Lacan or psychoanalysis, and that's mm -hmm. the furthest things from their minds, you know? Um, that, that's a possibility. So you're-, you're no, they're, they're saying that they're doing it for the camera. They're doing it for the, for the, the passing of the image around uh, the internet. 
Right. I mean, I've, I've always, as an architectural critic, uh, I've always, you know, I mean, I'm guilty of projecting intentions onto architects that I have no idea if uh, they were there or not. And my excuse is always that, that architects are always, there's always uh, something at work subconsciously that leads the architect to express a zeitgeist of the era that they might not be aware of, that they're expressing these things, whether they're aware of them or, or not, because they're a product of a particular era and a particular zeitgeist. So I've always fallen back on that excuse. I, I don't know if that's true or not. But. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry if I'm making a lot of noise. The washing machine just will not stop spinning out. <laughs> can't, can't hear it. Yeah, okay. So yeah, Walter, I, I, I like that. And um, I guess you, you, you brought in issues of the real, didn't you? Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, but Indeed, the idea of, um, of the unconscious, uh, uh, I think it plays uh, a role on the level of architectural culture in that work. It's the phenomenon that since about 20 years now, uh, here in Belgium, at least, uh, there's a, the institutionalization of architecture has much increased. Um, and architects there has been a lot of promotion of young architecture uh, through exhibitions and, uh, uh, and other uh, media such as journals um, so architects are often being trained to make career first by um, intervening in, in exhibitions by creating images that are picked up yeah. by journals and um, so I think on that level, the, the, the zeitgeist certainly plays a role, as uh, I suggested. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that, that was the, the you know, me, media architecture was a product of postmodernism where, you know, buildings appeared in magazines and there, and there, uh, there, re, there was a result in a kind of a split between the building of the building and the creation of an, of an image for a magazine. And, and architects started to put the focus on the images for the magazines and started to neglect the building of the building. But, you know, Frank Gehry would be a good example. And, and I, I think, you know, teaching an architecture school, I find that phenomenon to be trickling down into architecture studios. I think students are much more concerned with creating something that they can take a good photograph of to put in their portfolio than in building a building that actually works well as a building. So I think that's a product of that, Mies. Yeah. I think we have to give Mies credit. He was, he was the first to brilliantly explore and exploit um, the architecture of the image for the image. Mm -hmm. um, and when you go to the Barcelona Pavilion, pavilion uh, it's, <laughs> it disintegrates in front of your eyes. It, it's a number of images and reflections and angles and, and, and um, reconstructed points of view uh, is it's a marvelous place to be at least i enjoyed it but i i had to admit it's a phantasmagoria it as, as a building it's just not there as an image it's it's present um, it, it it doesn't function as a traditional building it doesn't house or shelter there, yeah there isn't one uh, but when you're when you i'm sure all of us have had this experience of talking about the imagination in an architecture context in school or uh, at critiques or something like this. And we realize, well, if, if I mention the, arch the Lacanian imaginary here, I'll be thrown out of the room. There's, there's no connection. Architects speak of imagination as, as something, you know, you can't have enough of it. Uh, and, and of course, Lacan says, no, you can not only have enough of it, you can get too much of it rather quickly. Uh, and, and it becomes, uh, both ideological and uh, deformative. Oh, yeah, it puts limits on it for sure, which it should. I, I, I just wonder whether the game that, that these architects are playing is to take the picture of the space and its illusion in a way, and in, in a way as to make this photograph that you encounter online something compellingly real is that is that your argument walter what i'm i'm not sure i'm still developing the argument but one of the things that fascinates 
me, I think, is uh, or what I'm perhaps will develop is the um, starting from quite common idea uh, that um, actually architecture is something you can never grasp. It's um, um, as an as an object, some some architecture could can evoke that you could grasp it. That uh, that's the case uh, often in, in a sort of brutalist, uh, picturesque point of view, for example. But what the mirrors, for example, do is show that architecture is fundamentally fragmented, and the only way that as uh, an architect you can capture it is through a plan, a section, a perspective. But it's always one point of view. And the only way it comes together is by constructing it, but through our viewpoint, we can never capture it. Um, I think there's there's something there in, in the relation to the real that it's architecture of the real always escapes our, our view. Um, yeah. but I think but, but the that these pictures somehow that. do that particularly well. Yes, they, they show that indeed that you cannot grasp it in uh, one point of view and in addition that the architecture is developed through the interaction of different viewpoints. Uh, it is through plan, axonometric section by thinking from all these angles as well as through modeling that the object has been created. Um, it's that mirroring of different mm. viewpoints looking at one another. Uh, it's some sort of play. Uh, so I see the picture. Points going on. I see the picture and I can see that it's lying. And I know that if I go there, it can lie to me even better. Yeah. yeah and it is this like persistent that, yeah. sort of, okay, I'm, I, I'm lying to you. Uh, this is not the real. This is not the real. This is not the real. Ergo, yes, it's his, it's his game of this, of conjuring the real by um this thing that won't that never shows itself but uh doesn't go away i think it could also be seen as exposing the the lie that traditional architecture makes possibly but you know the the idea of an architect you know because i'm reading um al foster's return to real two right now for uh, another reason. And there isn't really, in fact, very much in there about the Lacanian reel. It's only really amounts to about three pages. Yeah, the reel in the title is not the Lacanian, Lacanian reel. It, yeah, it, yeah. And it, it, it's not the reel of realist philosophy either. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, if that if that book really did talk about the Lacanian reel, I wonder whether this this uh, case study that uh, we've had from Walter would uh, would would be a nice one for that. How does it play this game of of, of uh, getting you to sense this reel through a series of persistent lies? Persistent, well, you're calling it Trump Lois, persistent tricks. Yeah. This, um, I think it has, if, if Foster's reading can add something to, to it, um, I think it's true is inside of um, what he says about returns, uh, the neo avant-garde, and he uh, also what uh, Don has been. <laughs> talking uh, about uh, um, is that um, uh, re revision of, uh, of, a, of a discourse at play and of, of architects willing to be the other, the new avant-garde, um, um, showing some uh, gaps that are in, in the discourse or in the debates. Uh, and, Bring that to the surface. Am I right in thinking that this is uh, this this shop is for men's clothes? It's uh, no, that's the the lowest uh, uh, other flows one. The one is for female uh, and uh, underwear. Yeah, oh, it's for 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 women's clothes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Intimate clothes. 
intimate clothes. Yeah. Ah, 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 yeah. Now there you go. <laughs> the Demir team also figures in uh, in other uh, in in many of their other buildings. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's it's very explicit in that one. Um, it's not sort of crumb. It's more than a crumb play because the crumb play is everywhere in that shop. Uh, so it, um, yeah. Whereas in another building, it's more fragment. It's like the more. The, it has more the, the touche effect of uh, in the pictures or the photographs of their buildings. Mm. Then suddenly you see something. Oh, here's something wrong here in that picture. And, uh, yeah. It only really comes well um, being uh, really. Great, uh, close attention to it. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I remember, uh, you know, saying, you know, well, what is the real? And getting an answer and the psychoanalyst saying, but yeah, you'll want to ask a woman as well. Yeah, no, I, okay, so that, that for me, that's evidence that it's, it's, it's for, for intimate apparel of the woman, where the, 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 the game, of the real and the imaginary is well, yeah. Yeah, there's there's indeed there's an argument to be made about the gaze in that sort of programmatic context, perhaps as well. I've not gone in. Go, uh, I didn't went into. I didn't uh, go into that now. But uh, uh. well, seduction, you know, it, 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 it's yeah, and that would seem to me an important piece of information that this is where you go to purchase these ob objects of seduction you know yeah prothesis would work for Hal Foster for sure well I don't know about prothesis but certainly there are times uh, in the process of seduction where reality is not a very welcome thing you know yeah Well, that's me done, yeah. Okay, th thank you, thank you, Tim. Please lead. Yeah, then, then you, you read Lacan on the relation between the sexes and things get much more complicated. Love is impossible, Lacan says. Pretty well, right. shopping for underwear is possible, though. So. <laughs> when, when you're in bed with your lover, Lacan says, there are at least four other people in bed with you. <clears throat> yeah, not all of them are French. Nice. I think that was literal, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, what about the other four already there? The one thing I like about this discussion is that Vuther's examples uh, is sort of like a case study that has given us uh, a kind of place to roam around. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I think the other three presentations have been uh, more or less outlines of theoretical positions uh, and possible ways to go, uh, which, which I think is what, you know, I was thinking the session would be all about. But you know, without a case study, there's nothing really to talk about. You know, we all, I guess, growing up in architecture world, we like to look at stuff and say something. And it's 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 been really nice to have this balance between um, between these works, where uh, you know they're really nicely presented in terms of the architect's refusal to really say why they did what they did. Um, but it helped animate the rest of our discussion. Well, we could, we could uh, put ourselves into uh, the uh, building in playtime also. <laughs> yeah, and we could watch, watch the movie beforehand. But yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think that's, I, I've gone to some meetings of Lacanians and the things that I, I note that they, they don't kick me out because I have I have photos of of stuff, and you know they, they all they do is put their words on the screen and read them, and, and I actually show 
uh, images of pictures of buildings, of movies, of, uh, you know, I, I'm just an entertainment playboy there. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't help their discussion any, but, uh, but they're glad for the break. Uh, so, the, so I'm not going to get thrown out, but it occurs to me that in general, what, um, if you called us Lacanian architects or ar architectural Lacanians, what we have to offer the, the others who are in psychoanalysis um, is the fact that we're continually engaging with, with, with images, with things, with works of art, uh, with critiques, um, with, with other critics who don't have this Lacanian point of view. So we're, we're constantly having to say, well, Hal Foster is not a stupid guy. It's just that he wouldn't know the first thing about talking about Lacan. Well, actually, he does. But most of what I, I learn, most of what I know about Lacan, I learned from Hal Foster. Really? On arms at Cornell. His early books was, makes him sound like a Lacanian. Yes, Lacanian. Oh, okay. I have to apologize. Sorry. Let me think. Let me think of a non-Lacanian critic. That shouldn't be very hard to do. Uh, uh, a lot of his ideas came from Rosalind Krauss. Yeah, yeah. And well, Jameson's another example of a guy who is uh, kind of brilliant in his own way and sympathetic in many ways to psychoanalysis. Definitely. They, I think Jameson understands Lacan very well. Yeah, yeah, on many levels. Well, it's been two hours. Uh, maybe maybe we can wrap it up. It's been a scintillating discussion, scintillating presentations. I, I'm very excited uh, to see this continue. So so knock go knock uh, Andy on the head and uh, everybody else who didn't show up. Thanks uh, Tim for uh, providing comments. Thanks Francesco for uh, making an effort in the midst of travel. Wooder from Belgium, Don from Happy Valley there. <laughs> Just so. wanted to add that uh, the, um, these, these discussions are really helpful. Also, we, uh, there was a much shorter exercise, I think a couple of months ago, when we had to, to show one a picture each uh, right. of a building. Um, and uh, I remember Lawrence then saying, uh, and, uh, and we presented that, uh, um, uh, for example, I showed the, the shop by Hans Holine, also with mirrors in it, that, uh, that there was uh, not that sort of um, uh, element in it that perhaps had escaped his view. So I think th that brought me also to, to this different example that I think is more productive to, uh, to discuss mm -hmm. uh, in, in with, with the theories we we're interested in. So I, yeah, I just want to um, say actually that these uh, moments of collective reflection uh, are really helpful uh, to, to push yeah. analysis forward. Yeah, this is what Don. This is what Don. Organizing this. This is what Don has been promoting. Where work things out, get feedback, all part of the process. So we're just beginning, I would say. Uh, Tim, if you want to develop an abstract and a presentation for future meetings, by all means, feel free. Thank you, John. John, thanks for being first. It's yeah, heroic. I'm the pioneer. <laughs> now all I got to do is figure out how to put this on the cloud so people can access it. <laughs> it, it I think it goes there automatically. It asks you. There's a little dialogue box. Do you want to save this bloody big file or do you want to put it in the cloud? <laughs> okay, so, so I put it in the cloud then? Yeah, just, I think it's a, it gives you an, an option then it gives you a link. Then okay. you can share the link with everybody. I hope that's the way it works. I'm, okay. I'm new with this myself. Okay, I'll look into that. Well, it's great to see everybody. I, I'll see you on Wednesday, I guess. We have a general meeting on Wednesday, correct? Yep. Yep. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank you, John. Thanks, everybody. See ya. Thank you. Thank you.
to you. Bye from me as well. Bye, Francesca. Ciao, John. Ciao.